You're listening to the Turn Autism Around podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Barbera, and today I have an interview with a mom of two kids, and her name is Mandy Vaccaro, and I am interviewing her after she reached out back in the fall, and she sent me a picture and the following um, message, and I'm just going to read it. I, sometimes I give a listener shout out, but today I'm going to give a shout out to um, tell you what Mandy said uh on this message I got in the fall. She said, I'm not sure if you remember us, but we are the family whom you had helped several years ago, eight to be exact. Our son Jaden was nonverbal, had self-injurious behaviors, and then you came and showed me how to use ABA. Fast forward to today, Jaden's first day of middle school, he's a straight A student, football player, and is the most caring child ever. He cracks jokes all the time and his smile is contagious. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for being such a strong foundation for my son and giving me the tools I needed to connect to him and have a positive impact in his life. So that is such a nice message. As you could tell from this message, I worked with Jaden and Mandy with her son. I completely uh, almost forgot about them. I haven't been in touch with her for years, so she reached out. So I thought I would love to interview her. How did she help her son get from completely not talking and self-injurious all the way up to 11 years old, sixth grader who is doing great? So this is that interview. Um, I hope you enjoy it. So I'm so excited for Mandy. Thanks so much for joining us today, Mandy. Thank you for having me. So I like to start out all my interviews the same way. Describe your fall into the autism world. It was scary. (laughs) It was unknown and it was scary. Um, Unexpected, definitely unexpected. my son was very young and I know something that I struggled with early on was wondering if he was just developing slowly like all boys I was told do or if there actually was something going on with him um, that I wasn't fully addressing as a parent so that was scary And what what year was this, or how old was he when you first started to see signs? I actually noticed when he was around nine months old, I actually noticed um, he was struggling to do certain things, um, wouldn't sit himself up. I had to kind of prop him. And in the beginning, he was newborn, you know, he started cooing and looking at me and there was like some you know eye to eye contact and then i remember very distinctly around nine months um he stopped you know if i would say his name he stopped responding i would stand there and clap and say you know jaden jaden no head turning no nothing it was like i didn't even exist and i remember my mom watching him one day and she would say to me did he have a hearing test because i think he's deaf (laughs) Yeah, so that was that was hard. Him losing that. Were you think, were you thinking autism right away, or were you? Did you have any idea about autism? I didn't know anything about autism at that point. I honestly, I thought he was deaf. I thought he was either losing hearing or deaf. I mean, I would stand next to him and I would clap, you know, loudly, and I would say, "Jaden, Jaden," and it was just, you know. If there was an object in front of him, he'd be this close to it and he'd just be mesmerized by it and not even hear me at all. So did he have it? Did he have a hearing test? He had a hearing test and the hearing test was normal. He was perfectly, perfectly normal. Yeah. Perfect hearing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like this little stinker. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. The, the, 
the a lack of reaction to sound and to calling your name is is really a, one of the earliest red flags. I know for Lucas, we also uh, thought maybe he had a hearing problem. But the other thing is we would say, Lucas, Lucas, we would clap. We would do all the things you're describing. But then we would, you know, the Jeopardy song would come on or the lottery <laughs> and he'd come tearing around the corner. So some sounds he would respond to. And so that should have been our first clue that it actually wasn't a hearing test, uh, hearing loss, but, but we did also get a hearing test. But that is actually a sign, uh, a sign that I don't think any other podcast guest has talked about how big of a sign that that is. And, um, okay. So, um, so you started having concerns around nine months. Uh, you got a hearing test at some point, at what point did you call in early intervention to, to try to evaluate him or try to start services? Um, I remember sitting down with his pediatrician for just the follow-up. And I don't remember if it was his, I feel like it was his one year checkup and his doctor held out a pen to him and he said and he just held it in front of him and he he was saying his name and it wasn't until I had my second child that I realized like what he was doing and I know that sounds awful but when I had my second child she grabbed everything anything you put in front of her even before nine months she wanted to be in on everything you were doing you set something on the table it's in her hand you know I remember chasing her around trying to keep everything away from her and he's holding this pen saying Jaden Jaden could have cared less. He was turned looking at the pictures on the wall and anything but his voice, his face, or the pen. And he wanted him to pick it up and to grab it and hold it. And I don't know if he couldn't or wouldn't, but it didn't happen. And that's when his doctor said, I really think he would benefit from early intervention because I think he just needs a little push. And they didn't say autism at that point. It was just, he might be just really delayed developmentally so he had suggested reaching out and so that. what kind of early intervention did you get and and most people in the united states do qualify for either free or very low cost evaluations and treatment within your home for a child under three mm -hmm. so it sounds like you contacted your birth to three yep. agency and um well, I kind of know the story because I was actually one of those early intervention providers because you do live um, fairly local. So, but before I started with Jaden, um, what other kind of professionals came to your home? Uh, we had a speech. There was a speech therapist. There was an occupational therapist. Um, the occupational therapist, uh, well, that one was hard for Jaden. She really helped me with the eating problems. He had a lot of eating problems. Um, and I remember feeding him was really difficult. Um, she would kind of, you know, massage his face muscles when he would try to chew things. And like textures were a big issue for him. You would put something in his mouth and he'd just kind of stick out his tongue like, oh, he didn't like how it felt. Um, he, would, he had a horrible gag reflex. He would gag and throw up all the time. And so she would just keep trying to help me with the food problems. And I mean, he definitely wasn't lacking in food. There were certain things he liked and, liked and that's all he ate, but trying new foods, you know, experimenting with different textures, she really helped with that. Um, and then the speech therapist, she's the one that had mentioned to me um, because that's where we had noticed the, I think the regression with him. And she had said, you know, it's not really my place to say this, but I think that you would be better off kind of looking in more of a direction towards like the autism angle. And that's literally the first time I'd ever heard of autism. And I didn't know what it was at that point. I was like, okay, what is autism? Um, did some research. And really that was just all it was, was me just researching and then talking to his dad about, hey, maybe we should do this you know, and he was in denial about it in the beginning because he's like, you know, you got to give it time. You got to let them, let them work with you. Just take it day by day. And I remember him really pushing me in that area and a lot of frustration because I was at home all the time. And I'm like, you're not, you're at home dealing with this. And, <laughs> you know, you go to work. Yeah. And, um, but those, those, right. those two people were probably the that was the beginning of the road. Um, 
And honestly, you know, they would say, these are some goals that we want for Jaden. And then I would see him not meeting them. And then that's when I was like, okay, there, something's not right. I'm not getting, I'm not, maybe I really do need to pursue that road because I'm not getting, he's not getting what he needs. Like he's not meeting these goals. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> Right. Right. So it sounds like, you know, and, and in my situation, I was the one in denial. My husband first mentioned the possibility of autism and, um, and, but I, I got a lot of false reassurance because, you know, my husband mentioned it. And then when, if I would bring it up to someone they're like, Oh yeah. Like the doctor, the pediatrician or the speech pathologist and, they would kind of be like, oh, you know, and so everybody was like dancing around the issue. But when I started to look into autism was when I realized that his symptoms were, were there. Actually, my, my uh, best performing video blog, it, it has almost, almost a half a million uh, views is, is it autism or speech delay? Mm -hmm. And we can post that in the show notes for this podcast, but it is, you know, it, there are very similar uh, symptoms and, and, you know, if you have a speech delay and then you've got feeding issues and sensory issues and problem behaviors and lack of awareness and lack of turning around when your name's called and lack of pointing, then that probably is more uh, indicative of autism. But um, your, your situation really does have a, a very, uh, you know, happy, it's not an ending, but you know, you, you, um, and we're going to talk about how Jaden's doing now, which is remarkably well. Um, and you know, we're, we're going to get into that in just a minute. In fact, right before we hit record, you said, you know, I, uh, Jaden knows that you're doing this podcast interview. He wants to listen. So he's only 12 years old now. He's 11. He's 11. Okay. So he's 11 years old. Um, okay. So, but before we get to, you know, kind of how he's doing and your hopes for the future and your advice to get kids, let's, let's kind of go back. Okay. He was, so at, at what point did I get involved with coming to your home? Um, so I had researched, you know, where to find you know, a doctor, where, where do I find a doctor that can just have a sit down and tell me what's going on with my son? And the wait list was incredibly long. It was like, I mean, at least a year when I was, when I was looking and that was, you know, back when he was not even three. So I literally just, you know, searched the quickest place I could get in to have someone sit down and it was Hershey. Um, close by. I mean, closer than Philly yeah. for me, but um, <laughs> I didn't want to go to Philly. I'm going to be honest with you. With his issues, I was like, no, I'm not taking him to Philly. <laughs> so, and that was the other thing too. I had to take, I had to think about his dad's work schedule at the time. Um, a lot of his therapy fell on me and I didn't, you know, am I, I, this is something I'm going to have to do on my own. Not, am I comfortable doing it, but can I do it? I have a small child too, you know, with him. It's something I would have to picture myself doing alone. Um, so I had contacted their office and um, I don't remember if I needed like a referral from his pediatrician or not. I'm pretty sure we just, you know, I said I had some concerns. He has, you know, some early intervention therapists working with him now. Um, they had kind of encouraged me to reach out and kind of research autism a little bit. And I was wondering if I could set an appointment and they got us in. We saw Dr. Tierney and that first, that first visit was really hard. He definitely, he had his true colors and, you know, it seemed like everything that she asked him to do. I sat there and I was like, Oh, no, I'm asking that. it's going to be so bad. <laughs> you know, and he just <laughs> shined through, you know, this, the high pitched screaming, the head banging, you know, the slamming things, you know, going and running and, I mean, it was, you know, and he and his dad and I just sat there like, yep, this is it. This is how he is. <laughs> and then um, she, she had a, another doctor there with her and they left the room and they came back. Um, 
And I will never forget her sitting there with all of her notes. And she said, uh, mom and dad, have you ever heard of autism? And like, as soon as she said that, it wasn't even, I'm here because I want a diagnosis. It was just, I'm here because I want you to tell me what's going on with my son. And when she asked that question, I just, I knew like, yep, this is it. Like he, he does, he has it. I don't even honestly remember anything after her asking that. I know she talked about autism. She said, he definitely has autism. You're going to have to come back. There's, you know, this is a long road ahead. And I just kind of clocked out a little bit because I'm sitting there just thinking about what this is going to mean. It was hard to sit with. And that ride home after that was really, it was kind of, I know, it was hard. I just had to, even now thinking about it, like, it meant that everything was going to be different forever. It didn't mean, you know, it wasn't a death sentence, but it just meant that, you know, it, he is different and it is going to be different. And I just had to sit with that for that car ride and get used to it. And then by the time I got home, I said, okay, he's different. Now, what do I do? And I remember getting on the phone that day and, you know, calling early intervention and saying, I have an autism diagnosis. Now what? And they said, okay, now we can get the help he needs because you have that diagnosis. And they just needed, you know, the paperwork from the doctor and all of that. But it was like, as soon as we had the diagnosis, the doors opened. There was no more, you know, just this, it wasn't mindless, but it was just these routines of, you know, I know we're not getting anywhere, but we're going to keep doing this. But it was like, as soon as we had that golden ticket, it was like, okay, now you have more resources. Now we can help you. And then that's when they had said, you know, we're going to send a different therapist to your home. And it was shortly after that, I got a phone call and it was, hi, um, you know, we have this, this book that we got here. Um, we've noticed with a few of our clients, it's been working. Would you be interested in reading it? Um, we know the author, she just joined us. Um, we could have her come out to your home. She only has a few clients right now. And at that point I was like, yep, yep. Bring her over, bring her over. <laughs> yep, I want the book, let me read the book. <laughs> So, yeah, because I had just started with early intervention, birth to three with a contract in 2010 when I left the Verbal Behavior Project. So um, Jaden was one of my first, you know, handful or two of clients um, back then. And I do remember coming and, you know, and, and when I went into other people's homes, um, sometimes I would go and they've already had other early intervention providers in their homes. Sometimes I went just straight from the, the start and I, I kind of went and um, took the place of one hour of speech, one hour of OT and one hour of teacher and went for three hour chunks to some people's houses. And sometimes like in your case, I would go in and I would supplement and work with the speech therapist that so was already on site and the OT that was already on site. And what I found is that like Jaden, a lot of kids with autism, but also those with, with signs of autism when they're young, you know, that some of the very traditional um, things that early intervention professionals try actually don't work or don't work well. And then you get problem behaviors and meanwhile, you know, you might get problem behaviors for sleep or whatever. And so the mom is, is usually the one that's home almost in all cases, but sometimes I've had the dad home, but you know, the mom is pulling her hair out because the kid's not sleeping. And then she has the OT and the OT is like, oh, well, you, you know, he needs his pacifier for soothing or he needs his blanket or whatever. And then the speech therapist will say, no, no, no pacifier. That's not good for his talking right. and his articulation and, and, um, and, and really it's, it's just like neither of those are right or wrong. It's just that each child needs an individualized plan mm -hmm. and a lot of parent training. And so, um, yeah, so, so, so I came in and at that point, Jaden had self injurious behavior, screaming. I'm not sure if he was talking at all. Um, not talking at all, um, shaking your head no. <laughs> so, um, 
Yeah. So he didn't have any language, but I think we, we pretty quickly uh, used some of the techniques that I now teach in my online courses um, to get him talking and get his tantrums down and get him, you know, I don't know if I helped at all with feeding, but I do now have expertise in feeding and sleeping and all the issues that come along. But um, when, when the doctor diagnosed Jaden and, and, and you were doing your reading, did you, did you have hope for recovery or hope that Jaden could, could be included and potentially go to college and get married? And was, was that a big thing for you? I think in the back of my mind, that was the hope, but like thinking back, you know, how I was feeling, I felt a little hopeless. Um, it wasn't until I started seeing progress that I knew, okay, it's going to be a long road to get there, but we're going to get there. And that gave me hope. Um, and I remember, honestly, I remember the first time that you came with him, you, you pulled into the driveway and you walked up, you had a bag in your arm and you had wooden puzzles in your bag. I will never forget this. And honestly, I think that day I cried because it was like, this is going to work and he's going to get, we're going to get this. Um, you sat down on the sidewalk with me. I was just sitting on the step and I was losing my mind. And you said, hi, I'm Mary. And you were, you know, introducing yourself to me. And he came, Jaden came over because he's, you know, my attention was not on him for one second and that was not okay. And you, it was like, you did, it didn't even phase you. This child's like tantruming right next to me. And he goes to take his head and hit it on the pavement and you put your hand right where his head was gonna go and still keeping eye contact with me, not even paying attention to him, but just slid the hand in there real quick and then looked at me and just nodded and kept going on with the conversation. And I was like, I remember just freezing for a second and thinking, yep, this is gonna work. <laughs> and then the puzzles, you know, he wanted that puzzle that you had in your bag and you kept closing your bag because he kept trying to grab, you know, the bag. And you looked at him and you said, I'm talking to your mother, first your mom, and then puzzles, you know, and you pulled the bag close to you and, oh, he screamed and carried on. And then you said, okay, no puzzles. <laughs> and you just held the bag close to you and we kept talking. And then he's trying to get attention and it's not going anywhere. And he's ended up stopping. And I'm like, where have you been? <laughs> Why haven't you been here sooner? But I remember that day definitely feeling hope because, you know, these were techniques that I hadn't really tried that much before, but it definitely worked for him and it got through to him. And I was still able to have a conversation with you. And that was, yeah, something. I'd like, I told, I have a, not a very good memory for things, but I, I don't remember that. And, and part of what I was doing there you know, thinking back um, or hearing the story is, is I was assessing like what he was going to do if mm -hmm. I said no and what he was. So I was, I was in full blown assessment mode. Plus I was also trying to get your, what, yeah. where he was, what he was doing. Um, you know, was he able to talk and all that? So I was, I was doing assessment. Well, good thing I didn't let him hit his head on the cement because that <laughs> is not a good thing. Um, you it and right now over the, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we're talking, you know, 10 years ago is when I came and, and I have to say that, you know, even my procedures, which I, which Jaden and you were part of, uh, the families that helped me create my step-by-step -step system for toddlers and preschoolers, especially was um, my, my systems have, has even evolved further mm -hmm. to be like as child friendly, less crying. Like I do not like crying at all. And um, you know, just hearing the story, like I'm thinking probably in hindsight, like just hearing that bit of a story, <laughs> I probably would have moved inside to prevent the cement hitting, <laughs> you know, um, I probably would have, you know, moved into a, a, a nice, you know, I don't, I don't like if he were grabbing at my bag now, I'd probably like, 
you know, get it out and see if I could engage him because he has high motivation. But, you know, for each child, it's, it's moment by moment decisions and, and being a behavior analyst since 2003 and working with, with hundreds, if not thousands of kids directly, um, you know, you, it's, it is, a, it is science, but it's also an art and there's a dance to it. And each situation is so different. So that it, it, it brings back nice memories that you have, you know, that I gave you hope that things could turn around because they definitely did. And then I was able to get um, and, bring, and get you services. Like people, you know, really do, kids like Jaden really do need not just a little bit of this or a little bit of that, one hour here, one hour there. They need a comprehensive program in order to reach their, their fullest potential and have the best outcome. So that um, we work together and, and most of my families, we got like 20 hours of therapy a week paid for by your insurance at, you know, at time, the systems so that families didn't go bankrupt in terms of providing 20 hours of care. I also... Um, got you with a company that had another behavior analyst because I was being paid by the birth to three agency. And so when he, when kids turn three, then the payment structure changes, which is another stress that I don't think we've ever even talked about on this podcast, but that's stressful. You get a diagnosis and then you have to switch systems and suddenly comes not at home, but in the center taking less time away from parent training and the 24 seven kind of struggles. Mm -hmm. um, that's really tough. Let's talk about his transition, not, not just to, to three to five agency, but really to school. Like at what point did he start talking? Did he start playing? Did you have a glimmer of hope that he was going to catch up in any way? Um, I think it was during his third year that he started talking, I want to say during his third year, I remember there was kind of a crunch because um, we wanted to get him into some type of educational program um, to kind of encourage the interaction with other kids, but also the talking. And there was just a lot of screaming. Um, I remember his first word uh, was a full out battle with with he and his dad for about 45 minutes. And I remember the therapist working with us had said, put a paper on the side of your fridge and write down, you know, the first word and when, and just keep it there. And as he does more words, you're going to, you're going to see that list is going to grow. So I would say probably about when he was three, um, there were so many hurdles, but man, was that a battle getting that one word? <laughs> I thought, you know, we get that one word, we're good. We're going to cross that bridge. There's going to be more words, but 45 minutes. Woo, I, I remember thinking if this is what it's going to take for another word, I don't know if we can do this. <laughs> what was the first word? Cup. <laughs> okay. So how did he get from saying cup at the age of three, let's say, to being conversational and, and uh, like, was that just a process? Did that just take time? Um, lots of therapy? It was a lot of therapy. I remember, um, I remember the behavior analyst that was working with us, you know, she would say, don't, don't say, you know, don't do the baby language with him. Don't, you know, say dad, dad, mama, and all that, you know, she said, it's, you know, daddy, mommy, cup, instead of, you know, like baba or bottle or whatever it was, you know, she said, just talk to him. You know, even though he's not saying things back to you, he hears what you're saying. And when he starts speaking, he will say, you know, what you're, what you're pouring into him. And so I remember even just sitting and reading books at night with him, I would read the same books over and over. And there would be no, he wouldn't try to sound out words. I would point to words and say words. And you know, she'd say, don't give up, keep doing it. The more you do it, just keep doing it. It will happen. And I remember he just, it, you know, he, he just picked up with it and we celebrated every word and then putting words together. And even the one night sitting down and I'll never forget one of the books I read to him. He loved the Clifford books and he would sit there 
And when he picked up language, he took off with it. When he finally spoke, he took off with it. And he had this Clifford book in his lap and he had that book memorized, like word for word. He wouldn't even have the page turned and he'd be reading the next page. And I remember recording him doing this and like, oh my gosh, he has it memorized. Just the repetition, but you know, he would talk about this big red dog and <laughs> he would sniff after every page because he had these weird little, you know, quirks, but oh, it was so adorable. But he really took off. Like once he actually started speaking, it was, it was pretty much just like she had said, you know, he's just going to take off. He's got it. It's in his brain. Just when it happens, don't worry, it will happen. Yeah, that's great. And now he's in what grade? He's in sixth grade. And he does not have an IEP anymore. Mm -hmm. He is. And so that, that main, was faded. Mainstream now. He's, you know, the school had reached out to us and said, you know, we don't really think that he needs these services anymore. And it's only because he's not using them. Like they're available to him. You know, everything that he needs is available to him per his plan. And they said, but he hasn't used it in this long. And it was probably before he even went to middle school. And they had said, you know, if he's not using them, I mean, we're here for him, but he, there's no reason why he can't just be with everybody else, you know? And I remember yeah. being so nervous about that. Like, you know, when I talked to his dad about it, his dad's like, I'm all for it. Let's go, let's do it. You know, no problems, great. No IT, great, let's do it. No looking back. And I was just like, oh, I don't know. Is he ready? Is he going to be okay? And he's like, is he going to be okay? You know, look at him. He's going to be fine. <laughs> but yeah. And time. so, so he is, you had, uh, the way this whole uh, interview got scheduled was back in the fall, you had reached out to me and you told me, you reminded me that I worked with your son um, back in like 2010 and um and that you told me that he's he's straight A student, football player, and a very caring child. Mm -hmm. um, so, does he still have a lot of um, a lot of autism um, issues? I still see it as his parent. I think the biggest thing now is more the social piece. Um, and that's hard. And he doesn't talk about that. Like, he doesn't talk about social interactions really with school. And he, I mean, there's been situations at school that have happened where, you know, he'll vaguely talk about something, doesn't give a lot of detail, but it seems like his approach is very standoffish. And it doesn't bother him one bit being that way, not full on interacting, he's totally fine. Not really, I don't wanna say socializing, but he doesn't really, <laughs> he's there, but he's not fully involved. He's doing what everyone's doing, but he's not really creating bonds, I guess you could say. It's more mm -hmm. my perspective. Um, the sports have been really, really good for him, especially football, he loves football. And they always say, you know, autistic kids have their thing. I would say football is definitely his thing. He's knows all about the sport, all about players and stats and, you know, college football, professional football, you name it. It's that's his thing. And seeing him on the field is, it's really good for him because he's had to learn and it hasn't always been easy, but he's had to learn how to be a team player and it's definitely tricky with someone with autism. And I think my biggest frustration um, has been how the other kids are with him. Because a lot of people know, you know, he has autism or he's different, which frustrates me. <laughs> but sometimes they don't know how to treat him, if that makes yeah. sense. And that's well, and there's a lot of bling and a lot of clicks and all kinds of things, even if all the kids are typical, it's still mm -hmm. yeah. kind of a, a really tough situation to navigate socially, even if 
you're socially very competent. So I can imagine if you've got, uh, you know, some social differences, it, it makes it even tougher. Um, so Jaden knows he has autism and h- how did that, did, was that a conversation or was that like, just like he always knew or? I, I'm pretty sure I had a conversation with him. I don't, I didn't make a big deal about it and I didn't want to make a big deal about it. Um, it was, I'm pretty sure it was, there was an interaction with him and a group of kids and he, he has this tendency to make like little songs about people. He does these little like sing song things or he'll make nicknames for people. And I remember having to have a conversation with him, you know, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. You know, in your mind, this is something that's funny. This is something that, this is how you associate with this person, but in their mind, this is what they're thinking. And so maybe you can do that in your room, you know, when nobody's around, you can do these songs or you could maybe even journal, you know, the sing song or keep it at home. And then when you're out with them, just use their name. And I had to explain to him like the difference between him and these other kids. And he didn't really, he didn't take it bad at all. He just kind of shrugged. Like he wasn't, it wasn't something that he, you know, it wasn't like life changing for him. Shortly after that though, he did say something really funny. Um, there was a fly flying around in the house and it kept landing like on his face. He got really upset and he swatted at, at it. And then he goes, mom, that fly has autism. <laughs> well, I was like, what? And he goes, it just keeps at me. And I thought, wow, that's very, wow, that's deep. That's quite the perspective there. The fly has autism, but he totally <laughs> like, funny. he just, you know, when something, you know, or even like an object, if an object just keeps falling over or keeps frustrating him or something, he'd say, it had, he would say it has autism, you know, <laughs> he just got very frustrated and I'd be like, it has autism, but okay. <laughs> but he definitely, yeah, that's you know, funny. they did talk to him about it at his school too. Um, I'm pretty sure just recently even too, when they had, you know, put him into just the mainstream I was kind of curious what they had told him, you know, what did they say to you when they had explained it? And he said, um, what they had told him was just that sometimes there are cases where some kids need more resources than others to get the job done. And he doesn't need those resources anymore because he's figured out how to do it. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. (laughs) It's one way to put it. Okay. So um, one, one of the things that we talked about before hitting record is that you um, got a divorce from Jaden's father. uh, And when you were separated, he was about kindergarten. So I'm just wondering how that, if that affected the situation with Jaden and his progress, or how is that now to, to go between homes and that sort of thing? The biggest thing for Jaden was the separation, leaving dad and coming to mom or leaving mom and going to dad. That was hard for him. So I think kind of letting him know like, you know, tomorrow you're going to be with dad. Okay. And just doing the mental preparation for him. um, Letting him know like, you know, dad is going to meet us here. That's where you're going to go. Then you're going to go be with your dad. Um, And then, dad would bring him back and it was just getting him back in that routine you know having the same schedule this is what's going to happen that's what happens really helped him um, as far as like the separation piece um it was hard for me as a mom though because seeing him struggle it was like is this really worth it i just let him stay there and just not even you know push to have this change in routine or whatever, but it got better. Time helped with that. And he got used to the routines. Um, It's really hard co-parenting sometimes, especially with an autistic child. And when he was younger, it was really difficult because it was hard to keep things the same 
in two different places. And establishing these routines was hard. But once we got through that, just, you know, repetition, um, helping him know, like, this is what you're going to, you know, this is what's going to happen. This is what we do. First this, then that. And following through with it. And him seeing that really helped curb a lot of that. There was, there was tantrum. There was, I wouldn't say there was a lot of, like, regression, but he definitely was testing the waters. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's hard to have, you know, even two parents who are living together and married to be on the same page. And then you have, you know, the different styles, the different parenting styles, the different, you know, you got a lot more training, I'm sure, on therapeutic intervention than he did uh, just because you were home. Um, and then now you have the two physical locations, like you said, to try to keep them stable for him. I'm yeah. sure that that presented challenges, but it sounds like you've figured that out as long along the way as well, which is great. Um, so what are some pieces of advice that you would give to your younger self or you would give to your best friend going through, you know, an autism diagnosis or signs of autism? Like what, what advice or just a couple of things that you would kind of say? I think looking back, the advice that I would give myself is not to sweat the small stuff. A lot of the stuff that I really got worried about is not even part of the picture anymore. I think focusing on the big picture things, the goals, having hope, and just staying focused on that would really alleviate a lot of stress. I mean, <laughs> if I could go back and redo it, that's what I definitely would do. It was not so much you know, oh my goodness, my child, you know, when he's with kids his age, he's not doing the things that that other child's doing. Who cares? You know, who cares? Focus on the big picture things, you know, can he talk? Can he, you know, because when he first started talking, then it was, well, but he's not doing it fast enough now. And it's, it was this comparison thing I had to really just get over. If I could go back, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even bother with it. I would just take the advice of the professionals, follow they know what they're talking about. They do. It works to take it step by step, day by day. But don't ignore your gut feelings too. I know that reassurance piece that we talked about in the beginning, I got a lot of that. And I think it's okay to say, you know, oh, okay. You know, I hear what you're saying. You know, oh, he's a boy. He develops slowly. Okay. Okay. Yep. I hear that. But at the end of the day, this is my son. And I know that something's not right and I'm going to fight for that. Being his advocate, and I had said from day one, I was his voice when he didn't have one. I was his advocate. I always will be no matter what happens. You know, no matter, <laughs> you know, through the divorce, through whatever milestones we hit with him, you know, as he ages, he's, we have puberty coming now and <laughs> the bullying at school and the sports and what are his goals and him talking about driving in the future and things like that. Just listen to your gut and take it day by day, really. And listen to your child, yeah. <laughs> you know, even yeah. if they're not speaking, they're telling you something. Yeah. What are your hopes for Jaden? Are you, are you envisioning that he's going to drive and go to college and the, do those things? Are you yep. hopeful? Yep. I, Honestly, I had to learn a lot from his dad too, which I know it sounds crazy, but his dad, I feel like in the beginning had denial about things and then there was acceptance. It was, okay, he has autism. Let's do this. Let's fix it. And I had a lot of frustration with that when I was younger because I thought like, this is not an easy fix. You can't just fix this it takes time and you have to learn how to work with it and then kind of mold it where you want it to go. And you have hopes and dreams, but you can't really put a whole lot of weight into them because you don't know if it's really going to happen. But he kind of held steadfast, like, no, this is going to happen. And even just 
I feel like he, he, you know, he had these hopes and dreams. He's going to go to school. He's not going to have an IEP. He's going to play sports. He's going to get good grades. It's going to happen. And it is happening. You know, in the back of his mind, he knows it potentially couldn't have, but we're kind of, you know, celebrating these victories. And so I had to learn to really push for just mainstream and these hopes. It is going to happen and we're going to push for it. If it doesn't, that's okay, but we're gonna push for it. And not making a big deal about it too, even. Just, yeah, he's autistic, okay. So, he's very smart. Um, he just started playing rugby not that long ago before the coronavirus <laughs> canceled everything. <laughs> um, this is a full contact sport and it's like, never thought he would be doing something like that. Like, where people are actually that close to him and he's totally fine with it just hugging this big old ball <laughs> and being told yeah, you know, well, this is how you play a sport and following instructions and doing it yeah following the rules and being on teams and also being flexible to navigate all the changes um i think it sounds like he's doing incredibly well and uh, i'm so happy that it, I was a small part of your journey to kind of help you turn things around. And uh, I really uh, do appreciate you contacting me and letting me know that because I think you can provide a lot of hope to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you can pro provide a lot of hope to um, parents of young children, which, you know, you don't know how it's going to turn out. And, and even for my son, Lucas, like he's at a different point. He's 23. He, he's never, you know, going to be able to play, never played sports, never going to drive, never going to get married. But that also doesn't mean that he can not have a happy life and I can't have a happy life. So mm -hmm. I really think that no matter how it turns out, it's always good to have goals. And mm -hmm. when, you know, when he's two, you can't, say, oh, I hope he drives and, and, you know, the, you don't know how it's going to turn out, right. but, but, you know, I think setting or, or even setting hopes, not even setting goals because, mm -hmm. you know, you have no idea if he's going to drive or maybe he's going to not want to drive or be too anxious to drive. And, or maybe he's going to have to wait a couple of years. I know I just had Susie and Kelly Carpenter on the podcast a few weeks ago, which we can link in the show notes. And um, Kelly has, is 23 with autism and she learned to drive and she's dating and we talked about bullying and those sorts of things. So that's going to be a good episode for you to listen to as well. But, um, you know, it, it, she waited a couple of years extra to learn to drive. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times, especially boys, sometimes need the extra couple of years for maturity and decision making and those sorts of things. But, you know, there's the, if there's a will, there's a way. And if it doesn't, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to get there. But I think, you know, he's included now without an IEP playing football. Why shouldn't you... Um, hope for for things to continue to go well so i'm i'm really pleased to hear that um okay so let's wrap up i'd like to end with um talking about ways you can reduce stress and live a happy life part of my podcast goals is for the parents and professionals listening to be less stressed um do you have any self-care tips or any ways you reduce your stress At the end of the day, I definitely, sometimes it's with my kids, sometimes it's not, but I just need time to just exhale, just sit quietly and think about the day, listen to music. Um, I know some days, some days are not easy uh, with Jaden even now doing so well, um, getting him involved in things helps alleviate a lot of that stress but sometimes at the end of the day I think one of my favorite things is when he comes out and sits with me on the deck and we just talk and that's something that I never thought would happen with this journey and just having a conversation with him um, I think that is a big reward for me and I think that's also one way that has really helped me in this journey 
the, the small rewards, you know, at the end of the day where it was like, this was a really tough day and I need this little piece to just encourage me and it's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. <laughs> so yeah. just those little yeah. glimpses of like him as a person doesn't happen all the time, but that quiet time, even, you know, if it's by yourself, just taking time to just kind of decompress and put it away for the day and just separate and just tell yourself. And really think about like what you should be grateful for. I think Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, that quiet time at the end of the day and also like what went well, not just all Mm -hmm. the issues uh, and all the problems, but what went well. And you sound like you're, you know, really in a good space being grateful for the progress that Jaden has made and you've made along the way as well. And it definitely the autism diagnosis does change your life for sure. (laughs) Even if it ends up with a pretty, (laughs) yeah, a pretty good um, outcome. Uh, And, you know, the, the, the end is never here, you know? So like, my goal is for each child to reach his or her fullest potential and to be as safe as independent and as happy as possible. And I have the same goals for both Lucas and Spencer, who's, uh, you know, graduating from college and going to med school next year. And so it's the same thing. And you have a typical, typically developing daughter as well. And it's the same thing. We want all our kids and ourselves to be safe, independent, and happy. And so it's a constant journey and it's never over with or without autism. So I really appreciate your time and being here, Mandy. Um, You've given us great insights. Hopefully you've given a lot of people hope that uh, just keep, keep at it, Uh, put one foot in front of the other and, um, and live your life and, and try to try to move forward. I really appreciate you reaching out to me too, to let me know how great Jaden is doing. And I'll, I'll continue to hopefully keep in touch with you and, 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 uh, continue to wish you both well. Thank you.